Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who have been here before, thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are here for the first time, my show is all about celebrating. It's about celebrating an artist and their body of worth. And boy, am I excited about tonight's show because I get to celebrate Michael Orland. Now, I want to take you back 1997. I was booked in Atlantic City to perform at Trump's Taj Mahal. Uh, and it was the first time uh, that I was being booked there. Uh, I was booked a little pudgy, but the musical director was Michael Orland. Uh, that is, he was the rehearsal musical director. And I say this because I... And Michael, I don't know if you know this or not, but I was so excited to be working with you. Uh, and all of a sudden, I find out that we're going to be singing to tracks in Atlantic right. City. Right. And right. the tracks that were brought in, with all due respect to the guy who created them, were not good. I oh. remember going to the producer when they arrived in the mail, and I said, these tracks sound like roller rink music. And she said, Richard, don't worry about that. When you get to Trump's, when you get into the arena where we were performing, uh, it's going to sound like a symphony orchestra coming through. Uh, it was far removed from that. Far but from, far from. It's taken us a long time to get together again. So before we begin, I want to ask you, uh, yes, we yeah. are now uh, careening into year two of a little thing called a pandemic. And I want to know how you're dealing with everything really in the midst of all these changes in our it, lives. It is, it's such a scary time for everybody in the arts right now. I mean, like this is like the new norm. Like we don't have any theaters to go to or clubs to go to. And it's, it's very scary to me. And I can't wait till there is a time that people feel, you know, okay enough to go back into the clubs and that it's safe enough. But, um, you know, I've had to just modify a little bit of what I do. I, I Thankfully, all my students are all, you know, are just on FaceTime and Zoom. And I'm sure we'll talk about her later, but most of my students come from my friend Celeste, who is your friend too. And, um, and Anybody so I, you know- watching, If you've got Celeste as a friend, uh, you are a complete person. I agree. I agree with that. And I've been, I, I'll, I'll tell you the funny story about Celeste in my life. So many of monumental things in my life happened because of her. And I was with her when it happened and she was with me when it happened. So um, anyway, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I've just taken it all in that and I'm still doing some fun stuff like with, you know, oh God, I hate dropping names, but here goes with Kristen Chenoweth and Patty Lapone, but out here because I, you know, and Jennifer Lewis, which we'll talk about later. You know, it's just uh, that happy birthday, Jennifer. Just had a birthday. I know. I love that woman. So do and I. Absolutely. We go back, you know, so far, and like, you know, I've been doing stuff, and my friend Debbie Gravett, who I, you know, we go so far back. I'm the godfather of her three children. Wow. And anyway, so we've been we did it for a while when this pandemic started. She wanted to do. She she had the idea of doing like a free musical. The theater, you know, audition workshop that we did for like, I don't know, like 12 weeks. We did it for a long time and we got every, we got every, we called in every friend and it was so much fun. But, uh, you know, we've all adjusted and it's just, it's not the same. It's not the same. We're very huggy people, you know, all of us in show business and it, it, it feels weird to not have that human contact and it feels weird to not be in the same room with somebody when they're singing and I'm playing. It's just, it's not the same. And I, like I said, we've adjusted to it, but um, it's not easy. Now, today marks 321 days, can you believe it? Since Broadway, since Broadway shut down. Uh, and of course, that affects the work that you're doing as well. What did your calendar look like on March 11th of last year? Well, I'll tell you, on March 9th, I had a show with Lucy Arnaz in 
um, in Palm Springs. And then I flew like on a 6 a.m. flight out of Palm Springs to go meet Kristen Chenoweth. And I think we were in South Carolina and we did a show there. And I actually thought, oh my God, are we gonna go on? Cause they were just starting to like talk about it. And I remember Kristen came out um, and she, when and when they introduced her and we had her band and her background singers there, when they introduced her, she came out with a bottle of a uh, spray can of Lysol. Spraying <laughs> the and it, was, it literally brought the house down and which she always does anyway. But, um, you know, I, I we had all these dates, all these things, so many trips. I have not been to an airport or on an airplane since I came home on March 11th. I came home on the 11th and it, everything shut down a couple days later. It's just, it, and I, of course I had so much planned and so many trips and trips home to Massachusetts and New York and, um, you know, just, it's unreal. Now I live in Rockland County. I'm very near Celeste, uh, near Nyack. Um, and uh, I hope I didn't give away her address. Now everyone's gonna go after her. No, um, I mean, we'll still tell everybody she's in the uh, in the eight four five area code. Yes, well, we're, we're both in the same eight four five area code. Yeah. Uh, but I have not been in Manhattan since March of last year. As close as we are to Manhattan, yes, um, it's. It, 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 it's mind boggling. And I had, you know, my godson, Sam Gravitt, had just three weeks before taken over the role of Fierro in Wicked. And, uh, you know, I had so many friends in that show, Riley Costello and and um, and the girl who was playing Elphaba, Lindsay Pierce. And of course, Alexandra Billings was Madame Horrible. I mean, like all these, but Sam and, um, and Lindsay had just done, made their Broadway debut and as, as Elphaba and, and um, Fierro. Three weeks later, the shut the show shut down. It's just, it's unreal. You know, I, a few days ago, I interviewed Brittany Mack, and yeah. Brittany Mack was scheduled to open in six. Her Broadway debut. She's sitting in the dressing room, and then they get word the show's not going on tonight. And not only is the show not going on, but Broadway is shut down. And that was its opening night. Is that correct? It was the That's same the night. Oh my God. But I want to ask you, uh, when did you first hear about COVID? And I, you know, you're in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, what was the feel as things started to shut down there? Uh, and did it happen before or after New York? I, uh, we, I think we all watched New York, like go through its horrible everything. And then we got it here afterwards. And now of course, L California and LA in general is like so doing not well. But mm -hmm. thankfully, I mean, I, I I, mean, I know some people that have been diagnosed as positive, but they don't have all the bad symptoms and everything. They're, you know, handling it and they're well enough mm -hmm. and they're not compromised uh, so they can, you know, fight it. But it's scary, but here it's scary and like they just, um, made it like so restaurants can open again because we've been shut down for like the last month and um, which you know I feel bad for small businesses that you know how do they pay their rent it's unreal but now they're letting it open for and you only can do 25% yeah. like what how, I don't know any restaurant or any business that can mm -hmm. open and only and, may, and pay their bills serving 25% of the people. It's just bizarre. Well, you'll get the joke. So many friends in cabaret say 25%. We're used to that. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny. That's well, true. But Michael, I want to go back. I'm going to go all the way back to the very beginning. Um, I am very. No. I was just going to play some melodramatic. No, feel free. That's great. Um, I know that you're from Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I'm yeah. always interested when I interview someone of knowing about the five-year-old Michael Orlin. That's the time in your life before uh, you're encumbered with peer pressure, school, everything happening. What was your childhood like growing up in Worcester? Well, I come from, no, I'm kidding. I, I, I had the greatest upbringing. I have an, um, the most supportive family. I had two of the greatest grandmothers ever, ever, ever. And, um, you know, um, and siblings and stuff. But I, my family did not, well, so when I was three, the story goes, mm -hmm. uh, I had everybody in my family take me to see the movie Mary Poppins. And I came home and started playing it by ear. So, I, you know, I went with my mother, I went with my father, I went with my grand, each of my grandmothers. When my, one of my grandmothers came in from New York to visit, I was like, please take me. I had my aunts and uncles take me. Like, I just wanted to see Mary Poppins. And my, my, mo um, my mom says that I came home and started playing it. And so she took me to a piano teacher when I was four. And um, Mrs. Siegel, who I will never forget, 
on May Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, she, um, I, I, my, she's like, I, we don't start them this young, but my mother's like, sit down and play. And, um, <laughs> Good for you your know, mom. and I, I literally, um, started taking lessons that day and I, and I love it and I love everything I learned. And she only let me study classical and I would come home, uh, you know, after my lessons and take out, you know, the score to Fiddler on the Roof and the Barry Manilow books and the, and the Elton John books and the Billy Joel books. But she did not want to work on any of that with me. She only wanted me to do classical. And I'm so thankful for that now. But um, when I was going through all that, my mother and father did not encourage me to do the music thing. Now, I could not love them more. But they, um, because I was so good at numbers and math, they convinced me I should go to school to be an accountant. Hmm. And so I did because I was, you know, the good Jewish son. And I was miserable. And I tell kids all the time, I don't encourage anybody to drop out of school, but you have to be so passionate about what you want to do. I was willing to do anything to just play the piano. And that's a little part we'll talk about later. That's a little part where Celeste comes in because she was one of the first people I met right before I moved to New York. And um, Great person to meet. Oh, she was everything. So she really, I, I, you know, I know she just like, she's like, I it was not because of me. So much of this business, and you know this, Richard, is being in the right place at the right time. And yes, you have to be talented, but talented people don't get doors open. Being at the right place in the right time and knowing the right people and all that, that's what opens the door. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be talented and be a game player and, you know, be a team player after you get in. But it doesn't, I know too, but way too many talented people that didn't have the chance of American Idol to turn somebody into a superstar, you know, 20 years before the show started and they didn't get, get that opportunity or that, you know, exposure. But I was like, I don't want to do anything else but play the piano. And I remember dropping out of school and um, I moved to New York and I think I had $600 to my name and mm. 300 of I spent on um, getting, renting a piano. And I, w I moved there with my friend Penny and her brother was away for a year. And so we lived on his in his apartment in, uh, on 8th Street, a little studio apartment we shared. And it was, I mean, like, you know, I wasn't afraid. I didn't, nothing, you know, whatever. And that's literally how it all happened. But little five-year-old Michael was, um, I, 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 I'm so happy I followed like my gut and my dream and like, listen, uh, my, you are. Thank my, you and my accountant loves me because I give him some really nice detailed, um, you know, tax records every year. But it was not in my DNA to do that. But I tried. And I also promised my mother and father if I ever didn't get a job in music because I didn't have a college degree, I would go back. But now, were you getting opportunities in Worcester in surrounding areas as a musical director? Or did that all happen after you came to New York? It actually happened when I went to when I went to college. I grew. I found this group called the Eighth Avenue Review. It was a little dinner theater group in um, not Northampton. It was in um, Williamsburg, Massachusetts. And I became the musical director for the show. And I was making forty dollars a night. And I thought I was like so rich. And um, and I, I just had the best. We used to put on new a different musical like every two weeks. We literally just learned these shows. But we worked two nights a week, and I was making eighty bucks a week. And I was like, I'm rich. I'm out of college. I'm getting out of college. I'm moving to New York. And um, I mean, it was great training for me. And I there was a girl that I had worked with there. Um, her name was Eliza, and um, she and I um, were at school to get at uh, UMass together. And we, she said, let's go to um, let's go to um, the Cape. Let's go. Let's go thumb to the Cape. There's a lot of. Let's go to Provincetown. There's a lot of entertainers there. We had no money. We. I can't even believe this. I don't even know if my mother and father know this, but I, we thumbed, and I was like, I don't even. I'm not thumbing. I'm not doing this. I'm not getting in some stranger's car. And she was like, Fine, you stay. You stay back there. I'll thumb. This woman picked us up. I swear to God. And she said, I've never picked. And she's. Elise is like, Come on, Michael, get in. This woman's going to take us to Provincetown. And the woman said to us in the car, I've never picked up a hitchhiker, but my divorce got finalized today. And I'm so happy I wanted to do a good deed for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and and took us to Provincetown. And I'm not kidding. We went the first night we were there to see, tell me if I'm jumping ahead of the story. But no, we no, I, this is wonderful. We went, I think it was the post office cafe, I want to say, that Phyllis, 
the amazing Phyllis yes. Rothberg owned, who I love dearly. I haven't seen her in so many years, but I, um, we and went- And they just closed down this past year, so very uh, bad. Oh, I can't yeah. even believe it, but we saw, we went in to see this woman and she was like the best thing I'd ever seen. I'd never seen anything like her. She was like, she told jokes, she, told, she sang ballads, she sang funny songs. I had never seen an entertainer like this. And my friend Eliza, who was a singer and I was her pianist, she kept, she was like, we have to go see her again. We have to go see her again. And Eliza's like busy writing down all the songs she's doing because she wanted to go back and steal them all mm -hmm. and um, do them all. And Celeste, it was Celeste and Celeste in the middle of her show, looks at our table and looks at Eliza writing. She goes, who are you? Are you a, are you a reporter? And, are you a critic? Are you a critic? And I was mortified. And um, and Eliza was just, you know, we were like, no, we just love you. We're huge. I mean, anyway, we met Celeste that night. And she said to me, and I said, we're going to move to New York. And she said, when you move to New York, you look me up. And so there is my first destiny with Celeste. I'm not kidding. I went to New York. Now, you know, it's a huge, a huge town there. And you like rarely you can go days without seeing anybody, you know, on the street. I was in the street and I was doing, do you, of course you remember the club, Freddy's Nightclub? Oh, of course, yes. Supper Club. Aliza and my friend Tom and I had a, um, had a show and um, we were, and, and I literally, we were on the street getting ready to go, like I was going to um, sound check and I run into Celeste on the street. I'm not kidding. That's why I know it's like from up there. I ran into Celeste and I said, oh my God, I'm doing a show tonight. And you should come. And she said, I'll be there. I said, I will leave a ticket for you at the door. Celeste came to see the show. After the show, she said a bunch of things, one of which was, you are one of the best accompanists I've ever seen in my life. You got to call me tomorrow. And I'm going to, she said, I'm going to first um, call Bruce Hopkins, who books the duplex. Uh -huh. and I'm going to tell him all about you. And she said, there's another friend of mine, Amy Ryder, and her pianist is not feeling well. It was the, first, the beginning of all the AIDS stuff, and which we didn't know about then. And her, and mm -hmm. she was with the brilliant Bobby Bloom, and he was not um, doing well. And she said, "Amy's looking for a new pianist for someone to work with." And I, she called Amy for me, and Amy, that was it. Amy came over to my house the next day. She called Bruce. Bruce Hopkins hooked me up with Terry Lynn Paul, who I've not seen in thirty years. You know, she passed away. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know yeah. that. She passed away about uh, five, six years ago. She oh my god! A friend of mine. So she was one of the first people I ever played for in a club ever. And then, um, so the, it's a crazy story, Richard. But um, I literally had no money, and I was friends with Amy Engelberg. She was. Um, I, I went to college with Amy. That used to work at the duplex, and just completely separate. This is way before Amy worked in the piano bars. And Amy Ryder took me to dinner at the Waverly Diner. I had no money. She bought me a cheeseburger deluxe. I re I'll never forget it. And we went into this thing. And then we were going to meet Amy Ryder at the duplex. We were going to go sing a song to um, talk about Amy was doing her show, her her cabaret show in the upstairs room. This is the old duplex when it was. The old duplex, yes. And so we go into the duplex. So um, Amy Ryder gets up to sing. And Rob an, of Rob and Irv, the two brilliant owners of the club, Rob came up to me and he said, listen, our break pianist didn't show up. That was when the weekend, Karen Miller on the weekend had like, oh, wow. she had somebody to play for her for 30 minutes so she could get up from the piano because she played from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. The break pianist didn't show up. Do you want to play? And I was like, okay, I played. Amy Ryder got up and sang a song and then she passed my tip bowl around and I made like $60 or something. I was like, what is going on? I had just left the diner where Amy Engelberg had to pay for my hamburger because I had no money. And um, anyway, it's just like a series of events like that. And then I swore it, was a, it led to a lifelong friendship with Amy Ryder, who I'm actually going to go see later tonight. Say and, hello. Um, seen her. I will. She, uh, yeah, she is uh, amazing. She still, I still can get her to sing once in a while, but. Great. 
amazing and um and her wife jody uh, her wife suzette and then her, our our best friend jody uh, jody binstock that used to work at 88 a lot i don't know if you rem knew her mm -hmm. she, uh, i mean what year, what year did you come to new york well i came i came to new york in october of 81 the week I before i turned 20. i did the week before i turned 20 so i just gave my age away i don't care it's okay um, um, yeah, it's as long as I have uh, a ring light anywhere, I look good for 50 minutes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that um, I, I mean, like everything just led to that and just working in the piano bars all those long, all that time and working with Lena Katrakis and 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 getting to meet Karen, um, Karen Mason and all those amazing and Jennifer Lewis and Nancy Lamont, all those people. And, you know, I, we worked and then it's so I I played in. Um, when I when I was filling in for I think it was Mark Christopher that was the pianist then in um, in 1981 that was the break pianist for Karen. Well, Rob uh, Hoskins came up to me after he said, "You're great. We never stopped making drinks while you were playing. That's the sign of a good pianist to us." He said, "We're going to put you up on the weekends at Brandy's with Timmy Moore, and um, and as soon as we can get your own nights, we'll get your own nights." Well, within three months, I was working six nights a week in the piano bars, like nonstop. And and then playing for you know singers uh, you know in the cabarets because of the the hookup I had from Celeste, and then you know it just like went on and on and on and on and on like that. And it became a full time job. Can you it's, tell everyone? I mean, what you are doing right now? You're, you're taking me down memory lane because yeah. this is the same time that I discovered these rooms in New York. Right. Uh, if you can let everyone know from your own perspective, uh, what that time was like in New York, because there were so many of us. And we're all in the same age bracket uh, yep. that we're coming up at the same time. Yes. I'll tell and I don't you. Think any other period is like that. Maybe it is. I don't know. But there was something very special about 100%. the time. And it was right on, you know, uh, pre AIDS. Uh, it was just starting to, uh, yep. you know, infiltrate our community. Uh, but just take us back to your uh, memories of what that world was like. I will tell you, when I look back on it now, it was the greatest, greatest time of my life. I'm so thrilled that I had those those piano that piano bar experience and you know, talking to the, you know, the drunk people that wanted to get up and sing and just like dealing with all that. I think that, you know, I mean, I I think it developed, you know, who I was and who I became and everything. And I also learned every show tune ever written because I got sick of carrying all the music around mm -hmm. and um, it was just it was the best time it was the best of times and when i look back at it now i'm so appreciative i got a little burned out after five years of it and um but i look back now and i think every every um when i got a job years late way years later on um in on american idol like all those songs that i knew from the playing in the piano bars all those pop songs like that was all the songs they were doing and like and I just knew them all. So like my bosses were like, whoa, you know that too? And you don't need music for that. And so it just, it, it helped so much, but that I'm so thrilled. And, and, and so many of those people that are still with us are lifelong friends. You can't go through that, um, you know, that camp of that life camp together without still maintaining like Anne Marie McElroy and all those people. We're still like all close. We all get on Zoom together and everything. It's just, it was the best. It was the best, and all those people that got up and sang, and all the waiters and the bartenders that sang, and passing the tip bowl around, and just it was it was the best of times. It really was, and I I am so thankful for that. And I've been into the piano bar since. It's it, it. I know it's also great, and the people that are in it now are great. But it seems so different from what different. Our, from different. What ours was, and um. But you know, again. I was um, Celeste got a job on a cruise ship. We were for two weeks, two one week ships. We were opening. She got hired as the opening act for Wayland Flowers and Madam, the puppeteer. And um, Wayland came up to me. Um, Celeste was opening for him and he came up to me after our, his show. And he said, um, he said, that was spectacular what you just did. He said, I'm looking for a new musical director and, com and conductor. And he said, if you will let me move you to LA, I want to hire you as my conductor. Now, I had never rehearsed with him, never done anything. He just like hired me on the spot. And I was like, you know what? I think I want to try this. I want to try LA for a minute. And just that was um that was in eight the end of 86 when I started working with him. Before that moment happened, that uh 
LA was never on your radar as a place. No, never, never. And I, and I also came back so much. I came back, you know, for years, I came back and just like for months at a time and did shows and all that stuff. And, um, in 1989, I, I played at Rainbow and Stars with Debbie Gravett right after she won her Tony. And um, as she says, oh, did I mention a Tony? But um, yeah, but, you know, uh, it, it was just, it was everything. And I just, I couldn't believe my life. And I was just so happy sitting at a piano all day. I still do that every day. And it's just like, it's not work. But um, I did come out to LA. I didn't even get an apartment yet. I just was like, I'm only going to stay here for a little bit. I haven't left. <laughs> I haven't left. <laughs> How many years has it been now that you've been in LA? I so I got my first apartment on January 9th, January 13th of January 13th of 1987. Wow! Wow! How about that? So that's 13 and 21 is 34 years. It just took me 34 years. That's like my goal waist size. Uh, was it an easy transition from New York to L.A. for you? Well, you know, I always used to think of that um, song, New York, New York, that, you know, says if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. It is true. Because I think when you can survive in New York, everywhere else seems easy, at least when we lived there. Um, you know, it was like, you know, there was no middle. There was, you know, you were broke or you had a lot of money. And we had to work, you know, and I lived on an apartment on fifty on Ninth Avenue between 50 and 51st that I shared with Maggie Anderson, Maggie Work. Oh, yes. And, you know, it's the greatest of times. But we come home from the piano bars and, you know, there was a different doorman, a homeless doorman sitting on our stoop every night. We'd have to, like, get by them to get in the door. But, um, you know, it was... Um, Part of the trend of New York, though. No. What was that? I said, that's part of the charm of New York. Absolutely. And it was the great, like I said, it was the greatest. I loved it. But I never, ever thought I would stay in L.A. But literally one thing led to another thing. I met Barry Manilow through, I met Sam Harris. I mean, like, like well, Waylon passed away a year and a half after I moved here. And um, I had just started doing a bunch of stuff. And I just was like, I'm going to stay for a while and see what happens. And I just, I never left. And uh, again, I just like so the whole thing with Waylon and coming to LA was guided without trying by Celeste, and just because she was with me, I said so she was like my little angel. And even today, like when I was like, you know, I, my students, it's hard because students, you know, people can't afford, you know, these crazy rates right now. Not only did I lower my rates, but Celeste said, "My students need you, and I'm like going to send you people like to do these piano tracks and everything." And I've I literally am kept busy every day between my students and Celeste students, and we send each other people now, and it's just it's been it's been great. And so, like getting by in this thing, but I also got a dog, mm -hmm. which she's busy chewing on a bone right now, so I'm not going to disturb her. But okay. I, I got a dog in February, right before this whole COVID thing started, and I'm thankful that I have her. I adopted in March, just before a COVID hit here really bad, so I know what yeah. you mean. No, and it's just, I mean, to have that dog, you know, have that, you know, she's everything with me. And of course, because I've been home so much, she's a little bit, um, she does like to uh, follow me everywhere and it's hard to leave, but I make her practice, you know, leaving for a little bit here and there, but I take her everywhere. I just had her made into my emotional support animal. And if anyone knew me, she really is. That's wonderful. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that obviously the talent is there. Uh, yeah. But how much of your career uh, has been proactive in terms of you actually pursuing these opportunities? It sounds from what you're telling us that so many of these things came because you were at the right place at the right time. Um, has there been a period in your life where you've had to really go out and try to get the work? Or have you been one of, I'm knocking on wood, uh, one of the lucky uh, people that it's come your way? Um, I have to tell you that most of the time it's been that, but I have to tell you the funny story that that involves um, with American Idol. So when I, I was a rehearsal pianist for Barry Manilow, I think it was 93 or 94, like for his Showstoppers tour when he did all those um, show tunes. And I did a couple arrangements for him. And cause I was, you know, I, I love Broadway and I obsessed with Barry. And I think he's one of the greatest musicians of our time. I, I totally agree. And just one of the nicest guys ever. No. And um, I, 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 before you go there, uh, well, 
I'll tell you my story about Edna later. Oh, I, I'm here. I remember her at the piano bars. Edna Manilo uh, became such a fan of mine. Um, and she was always, she, her and Natalie Schaefer. Uh-huh. Uh, Powell. They, they yeah. used to come to everything. And so did you know Edna as well? I remember. Remember Edna would play when she was playing at Don't Tell Mamas. I didn't know it through Barry, but I remember Annette DeMeo. <laughs> this is so funny. I remember Annette DeMeo used to go, um, 10 minutes, Miss Manilo, and she used to go, I'm not going, I can't go on, I can't go on. <laughs> and like literally, and like they'd have to like Richard, uh, who was her pianist? Richard, um, was it Richard somebody? Um, um that used to play for um Sharon McKnight too, I think. No, maybe it was somebody different. Uh, no, anyway, but they'd have to like drag her on. No, no. When, she was I, on. when I knew Edna, Dick Gallagher was playing for oh, her. Oh, this was before Dick Gallagher. Then I promise you, this was before Dick Gallagher because I'm was the biggest Dick Gallagher fan. As a matter of fact, when I started working with Patty Patty Lapone. I couldn't wait to tell her that Dick was such a really great friend of mine, and she loved him. Loved yeah. him. Yeah. Um, anyway, but um, it's so funny because um, um, but uh. Edna, I, you, that was my favorite thing when every time Annette DeMeo would go on and knock on her door and say, where, you're, where uh, it's curtain time. And she used to go, I'm not, I can't go on. I can't go on. That's actually a very funny private joke with Sam Harris and me. We used to say when I traveled with Sam for years, he, we used to go, I used to go, come on, Sam, we got to go. He's like, I can't go on. Because <laughs> I had told him that Edna Manilow story. But oh, anyway, um, so, when I, so when I worked with Barry, I met, the guy who was his conductor, who was this brilliant musician, Kevin Bassinson, and this woman, Deborah Bird, who lived in New York for years. And she was um, one of Barry's um, background singers, but she was also, I would get together with her once in a while. She would call me for Barry. Every time they had to replace like a background singer, Deborah would call me and she and I would teach all the part. Well, she would teach it all. And I would play the piano. Mm -hmm. And to the, to whoever whoever the new singer was. So anyway, when it came to when Idol started, um, it was Burt Backrack week, and it was like I think the third or fourth week of American Idol season one. And Deborah Bird called me and she said, "Listen, we just started this new show on TV. It's called American Idol." And she said, "Burt Backrack is the mentor at next week." And she said, "I know you know every Burt Backrack song ever written. Can you come in and help us?" And I said. I'm so sorry, I have I have to do something tomorrow. A friend of mine asked me a favor and I can't call her and tell her no, and I'll tell you what that was. But, and she said, don't worry. She goes, this job is right up your alley. She said, I'll find somebody for tomorrow, but bug me again in three weeks. And I'm not that person. But I, for some reason in three weeks, I called her and I said, next time you need me, I will draw, because Amy Engelberg yelled, Amy and Wendy Engelberg yelled at me because they were obsessed with the show. And they said, call her back, get on that show. Mm -hmm. So um, she, I, I called her back and I said, next time you need me, I will drop anything you need and I will be there. And she, she called me and said, be at the Kodak Theater tomorrow morning. It's, it's a finale and we need you all week. And I was like, I, she said, be there at 8 a.m. I said, you know what time we get out? She's like, nope, just be here. <laughs> and, and that was it. I, and then we went to a, we did a um, like a top thirty two um, TV special out of Las Vegas, and the, my bosses Ken and Nigel offered me a job right there on the first day of that, where they had gotten to work with me. They're like, "We know this. We want you to know this just got you a permanent position on season two. And then I I never I didn't leave for sixteen years. Sixteen but years. I'll tell you, I, sixteen years. And I, we can go talk about Idol anytime. I love it, and I'm so thankful for that job. And it gave me so many opportunities and visibility to do so much. But um, this, the, I, I have to just tell you the funny story. The reason I said no to Deborah for, to go in the next day, I was very close friends with Estelle Getty of Golden Girls. Wow. And Estelle, we were friends forever. She used to come to every show I played for, even if it was after her, even if she taped all day or rehearsed all day, she would come to my shows at, in LA, all my all the cabaret shows I played, all when I played like uh, at the Rose Tattoo and the Cinegrill and all those amazing clubs that aren't there anymore. Um, and she would she was the most supportive friend. And um, she had asked me to come. She B Arthur was coming over to celebrate her birthday the next day, and she said, "I would just love you to be there, so we you know we have some fun and we'll have some laughs with you there." And I did not have the heart to call uh, Estelle. 
at you know six or seven o'clock at night and say, I can't be there tomorrow. And so I did not take the job with American Idol. So that's just like that. It was a lesson to me in the follow through. It's so important. I will tell anybody now. It's all about the follow through. And but I, I also I want to stop you for a moment. I also love the fact that you made a commitment and you stuck to it. Yeah, that's that's very because important because in business as well. Yeah, no, and I, I I just couldn't say no to my friend who had never asked me for anything, and I just didn't want to like go sorry. And she would have understood, believe me, saying you got a job on a TV show, get out of here. But I. Yeah. I didn't say a word. I didn't say one word. I went to lunch the next day and B. Arthur brought her cake over. And, you know, we had a little birthday lunch for Estelle, the three of us. And, you know, going back to um, Idol, uh, yeah. that opened a lot of doors. I mean, I can't begin to tell you. It's like every musical special, your name is in the credits there. Uh, I mean, you can't even imagine this career coming from Worcester uh, to piano bars in New York. Uh, to this, uh, what is it about that show? Um, you know, we love the show and everything, but shows come and go. Yeah, that show resonated and became such a part of our culture. Yeah, what, it, from your own opinion, do you think it's the American dream? Is that what it is for so many people? Well, I'm going to start first with the negative thing about those all those shows and including American Idol. They give people a false sense of becoming an overnight sensation because really there's no such thing, but people get famous today as we know for nothing or on social media or whatever. And these shows, these kids in the beginning when 30 million of people, 30 million people a night were watching them, they became overnight stars. They went from some of them never singing in their lives or singing at churches or karaoke nights or bars to where they liked to get mobbed on the street if we would go out. And, um, and and so I, I I think people in the later years were like, oh, I want to get famous. I want to go do it. Nobody paid their dues in the piano bars like we did for all those years. And working in, you know, at, at Don't Tell Mama's in the back room for 12 people. And we still had to go on and give them a full show. Mm -hmm. and, you know what I mean? They didn't have to do that. But that's the only negative thing about I think about that. because well, I'm glad you say this because so many people come along um, and, for example, um, let, I mean, let's talk about Fantasia. I mean, Fantasia goes to Broadway and she had a lot of issues with her vo voice from doing eight shows a week because yeah. that part of the preparation was missing from her. She was yeah. brilliant in the show. Uh, right. but there are all these other things that uh, underlie a performer being able to sustain a career. Yeah. Well, she's doing great now. I mean, you know, of course, you know, she had never experienced that, although these singers have never sung so much in their whole lives as they sing on those 12 weeks on Idol, or those 15 weeks. But I'll tell you, like, there were many people, Diana DeGarmo went to Hairspray, and Diana and Ace were in, you know, uh, so many shows, and they were totally fine, and Clay Aiken went in Spam a lot, and, you know, there were, there were very few issues. I, that was a really demanding role for her, I'm sure, and it was before she probably went to a teacher, but I know she's in great shape now, physically, uh, vocally, I'm, I mean. I'm a huge fan of hers. And I am too. I love her. But you, the, every single person that comes, comes from that show that still has a career today, either on Broadway or on records or on um, TV, film, anything, Catherine McPhee, all those people, um, Jennifer Hudson, they all, every single one of those people have the greatest work ethic. And that is the only difference with that that I, you you can't not have that you cannot not have that and um and i think that's why there were so many people that came from idol that had careers on top of that there was uh, the great thing about american idol there was always an, a management company in place that wanted these kids to have a life after idol and so it wasn't in those days because we were, they were just getting 30 million viewers a night two nights a week Nobody was worrying about the um, the ratings, which is only mm -hmm. that's all they do now. Every show, Idol, The Voice, America's Got Talent, that's all they care about is ratings and and all that stuff. And, and so it's not the same anymore. However, in the old days, in the heyday of Idol, when, you know, one week you could hear all Motown music and then the next week you could hear show tunes and the next week you heard big band music. Everybody in the family loved it. The parents loved it. 
because it was music they loved, the kids were learning. And when we did 90s week, the kids loved it and, and the parents were learning music. And when Lionel Richie came on that show as a mentor, his album sales shot through the roof. And when Neil Sadat, you know, like that's when that happened. And Donna Summer came on, her her record sales like went through the window again. And uh, anyway, it was just, it's it was a crazy time and it was a thrilling, I mean, I loved every single year of that and every one of those kids are I'm attached to and bonded musically for life with because I got to go through that experience with them. Mm -hmm. But um, even the ones that return to maybe they're doing something in their small town, it doesn't matter, they're happy and they're you know doing well, it doesn't even matter how big or whatever. And again, you have to remember that American Idol started before there was any social media. So um, that also makes a difference for the new kids, you know, who are coming down and kids say to me today, should I audition for Idol? Should I audition for The Voice? I say, yes, because if you get on it for one week, two weeks, three weeks, you can't get that much exposure if you played at a club for a year, two years. And so I say, yes, do it, because today it's so much about social media and, um, so I think that's all important, but um, you have you can't fake that work ethic. I'm sorry, and I know there are famous people out there who got famous from nothing, and they're on reality shows uh, without naming names. But I'm just saying, like musically, it's a whole different thing, mm -hmm. and um, you know you have to sustain that. Lauren Elena, she was a little 16 year old country girl on that show, and she's like a big star in Nashville now. Um, you know, it just and Adam Lambert. Like, you know, I've done a few shows and he could not be bigger if he tried. Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's it's thrilling. Well, and one of the things that I loved about the show is the fact that they bridge the past with the present. And yes. bring these seasoned uh, musicians uh, and artists on the show that these kids could glean something from. Yes. Um, who are some of the artists uh, that you have worked with who have made the biggest impact on both your professional and your personal life? Well, I will tell you that um, th through Idol, I, when Elton John was a uh, mentor, I'll have to tell I have to say sharing the piano bench with Elton John was pretty epic. And it goes, it's right up there with, you know, I don't know. But all those people that came on Gloria Estefan and Tony Bennett sitting at the piano while Tony Bennett listened to the season <laughs> six kids sing, you know, the standards, I was like, what? And you know, get, making friends with Gladys Knight because she was on the show, and Lulu, and like it's it's crazy what we what we all experienced together. Shania Twain, like every star, Dolly Parton, like every star was on that show. Everybody, everybody wanted to be on that show, and um, so those were all unbelievable experiences. And now you still have that excitement of meeting these people, and you know, I mean, these people uh, have such an impact on our lives. And Absolutely. We listen to and everything. So you've been very, very fortunate to meet these. Very people. fortunate. Then after Idol, I'll tell you, like, well, when when Wicked opened, I have to tell you, this is a funny story. When Wicked opened in, I don't know, it's what sixteen years now. It's like opened in 03 or 04, maybe. Um, um, I went to go see it, and Stephen Aremus, who's the brilliant conductor, oh, and music yes. director, who I'm just, I, I'm such a huge fan of his. Um, he, I went to go see the show and he said, I want you to come back and meet Adina and Kristen. So I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. I think it was even maybe a preview. I don't even remember, but it was very early on. And, um, I was so excited to meet them who I've gotten to work with both of them. But I went to Kristen's dressing room and Kristen was like, and he's like, this is my friend, Michael Orland from American Idol. She's like, I know. And like, she was one of those people that watched it so religious, like, you have to watch it so religiously if you knew who the guy at the piano was at the rehearsal set, you know, with the rehearsal scenes with the mentors. So like, um, that was pretty crazy. And so we formed that little, I don't know whether it was of some little bond. She came to LA and I saw, I ran into her a few times. She's like, you and I are gonna work together. She has impacted my life personally, professionally, in every way. She's, I have to tell you, when I think of a consummate artist, she, I've never seen her, and I hope this isn't jinxing her, I've never seen her have a bad performance when we do her concerts. She is so real, so down to earth. She rehearses so much. She's so prepared that I believe that when something goes wrong, she's so prepared that she knows how to get her, make her way out of it. I saw her, I watched her when I was helping her 
for their show when Mary Mitchell Campbell was her is her conductor and she's her main person. I watched her in front of 17,000 people forget the words to Over the Rainbow and made it work. She made a bit out of it and then she got the audience all back and did, finished the song. I mean, it was like, it was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. And I love and adore her. We're actually going into the studio in a few weeks to record a song for Burt Backrack. Oh, and that's so, wonderful. And, I'll tell you, I mean, the first time that I saw Kristen Chenoweth on stage uh, was at Carnegie Hall, and she was appearing with the New York City Gay Men's Chorus. She came out and she performed Glitter and Be Gay, and I, I'm sitting in the end of my seat in love with her. Three nights later, I saw her as Sally in Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. Complete opposite of what I saw mean, three nights before, and I think she is one of the most amazing talents and I would love to see uh, a big show built around her uh, on Broadway. Uh, it's there. Uh, we yep. just have to make it happen. Yeah. Well, I know she's done her show a few times with Richard Day. Uh, Richard J. Alexander directed her. She did a couple of concerts and uh, like uh, theatrical events for like a couple of weeks. I'm talking about a book show. I mean, Richard J. Alexander's work is phenomenal. I love their concerts together. Um, but I'm, I mean, there, there has to be that book show. I know that she wants to play Tammy Faye Baker. Yes, I've heard about that too. I've heard about that, but I know nothing. Okay. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Um, I will tell you this. I'm telling you, nobody has, um, nobody has, um, I, and I've worked with some amazing singers. I worked, I, I, you know, I still work with Rosalind Kind out here. We have the best time and we did so many. Hi, Rosie. I know she's watching. Hi, Roz. She's amazing. I love her. We go way back. I met her when at Wayland Flowers' house. She came over to rehearse with me for for like some private party we were doing, and we had we had the time of our lives. We've traveled all over the place, including we did a cruise last year out of Costa Rica. We've had some lots of fun together. But I mean, I love and I, I again, I have this amazing experience with everybody I work with. But um, I, I've gotten to travel so much with um, with Kristen lately, and I just. She's one of the most generous, loving, kind, real on stage. I mean, you know, I have to say that about most of the people I play for. I don't know anybody that that just fakes it or calls it in. They're just that's the trick, I think, to a successful performer, someone who knows how to be real and relate to the audience. And Michael, the flip side of that is that all of these people that you're mentioning, they love working with you. That's right. Mean, no, it's true. I mean, you have I mean, to be a musical director, there's a very special relationship between that person that is standing uh, behind the microphone or has the headset on and that guy who is making it all happen off on the side. But you have reached this level uh, of so many people. When I mentioned that you, I was going to be sitting down with you, everybody was very excited to watch tonight because you've achieved that level of success yourself. Uh, that everyone wants to work with you. Um, and I have yet to hear anyone say a negative thing about you. Uh, I, I owe nobody any money. I owe nobody money, so they're not going to say anything. But I, I, Being a good I hope Nancy, what about Nancy Tempanero? I love her. I hope she's watching. I, I mean, she was, well. she was one I had, went through a lot of life changes with. We, had, we were growing up together at the same time. And... Um, and Hampton Calloway, and I mean, just everybody, everybody. Uh, my friend Robin Lyon, who was in a chorus line forever, that 35 years, 40 years later, I still, we still, we started doing her show again. And it's been a joy to have her back in my life. It's just like, it's insane. And I, you know, it's just like to come back, there's all the, you know, you have these friends in your life too, where you don't speak to them for years at a time and you pick up the phone and it's like, you talked to them yesterday. There was no time passed, nothing. And it's just like, that's the kind of, I, I always say the, the relationship between a singer and a pianist is like literally the most intimate you can get. I'm breathing with them. I'm, I'm, I, I am one with them. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and I love those people. I work, I've been so blessed to work with, cause I, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not a, a good pianist. I'm saying that I feel more than the notes on the page. And so I, sometimes I'll add something or a play less or whatever. And, Every singer I've ever worked with, and I go, oh, I'll get that exact run in there later. They're like, no, just do what you just did. I just, I, and I love that. They're all about just, just go with me. And my favorite thing with Kristen is she'll do a different interpretation of a 
song we've done a hundred times, even, you know, Tale of the Latte Boy or Bring Him Home, she changes her phrasing. And I, I oh, sometimes I think it's a test to see if I'm listening, but I am on my tippy toes sitting on that bench. And I, you know, it's funny that you're saying this uh, because Mort Lindsay uh, said the same thing about Judy Garland. That's interesting. That's He's, interesting. Uh, playing for Judy, you really had to be listening at all times because, yeah. um, and it's not that they are trying to trick you or anything. No, it's I truly, believe that. It's truly that they are in the moment of what yeah. they are performing on stage. And it's what makes those people just epic on stage and just successful and what they, and loving what they do. It is, you're exactly right. And I love somebody who will reinterpret a song a different, uh, you know, a different way. I love that. I'm going with you. I'm going with you. With everyone that you've worked with, who is out there that you haven't worked with that you really would love to have the opportunity uh, in the future? You know, I just, um, I just started working with. Um, I did. I, I've done a lot of those um, big, huge, star-studded benefits. So I've gotten to work with amazing people like Cheyenne Jackson, and I just recently worked with Megan Hilty, who I just am obsessed with. God. And um, so many great people, and Leslie Ann Warren, and I mean, like so many people, and Mary Lou Henner. Best. I mean, she's the sweetest, nicest person. I, I mean, know. She's done your show. Uh, I'm sorry. She's done your show. Um, yeah. Yes, I knew that. And uh, a couple of times. Um, when I started this series, she was the first person I reached out to. I love that. Well, I, I, I you know, I just, um, I, I'm trying to think of who I, I'll tell you this. So I helped Mark Shaman with a song that he, had, he, he and Scott Whitman had written for an animated feature. And he called me up and he said, I need you to help me with Jennifer, uh, teach Jennifer Lewis the, her part. So I, I, we had the, I had the best time with Jennifer, of course, we go way back to, you know, better with the band and when she used to do all her shows that don't in the back room at Don't Tell Mama. So we go way back together. I also was hired to be a coach on Blackish for a couple of weeks. And so I got to see her on the set and everything mm -hmm. um, for some uh, for a musical number they did. And so it, it's so and I just love her and I follow her on social media. I'm obsessed with her. We you know, she's a superstar. And um but she, um, and I forgot my point I was making about Jennifer Lewis. Oh, so anyway, Mark called me back a few weeks later and he said, hey, how about I need to hire you again to, if you can just do the magic you did with Jennifer Lewis to do it with Patti Lapone because she's singing a part in this song too. And I was like, I, now I have to, I'm telling you, I mean, I was always a Patti Lapone fan, but I've never in my life met her, never, never ran into her. You know, um, I know a lot of, I work with a lot of people that are friends with her, but mm -hmm. I had never run it, whatever. And I have been having the time of my life. I'm going to see her on Sunday and Monday. We're recording something for a virtual benefit um, that she's doing, that she's donating her time to. But I have to tell you, she is unreal. And not only that, but the first time I called her to come over, she, I said, um, she said to me, um, I said, if I come over before one o'clock, I can leave my dog at home because someone's at my house. But if I come over before 11, I have to bring her. She's like, you have to bring her. You have to bring your dog. And she spent the first hour of our first rehearsal on the floor with the dog. And my dog, Jinx, who is like literally sound asleep on the couch. I'll show you her later. She, she, we love going to Auntie Patty's house now. That's great. Yeah, but I'm trying to think of anyone I would love to meet and work with, maybe share. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I'm trying, I open, I'm open to all opportunities. I just, again, I feel so blessed in all the people. Yeah, I'm going to ask you, I mean, I'm gonna start where we began. So we'll do a full circle here. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, you were the rehearsal pianist when I worked with Pudgy. Oh, uh, my God. Had you been working with Pudgy? Uh, prior to us working in Atlantic City. Well, uh, you know, Lenny Babish was her brilliant musical director for all those years. He was the most, and I love Lenny so much. And, Lenny uh, and I, um, well, I'm going to share this. My husband and I were one of the first 100 couples to get married in New York. Oh. Lenny Babish and Saul and Terry White was that we were all together. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. That's so we so all great. and I, Lenny, uh, Lenny Babish uh, Lenny, was the music yeah. director at our wedding. So oh my god, how what a small world! What a small world! But Lenny Babish was her long time forever, and like I would do like gigs with her, like she that he couldn't do, or, 
bar. Um, and, you know, I, I knew her from the piano bars because she and Mike, her husband, would come in all the time and Mike would get up and sing. And, and um, you know, and I I just, you know, we, I, I had never, Pudgy was like, is literally was the funniest female comedian I had ever seen in my whole life. I and um, every day. she was the most brilliant. And um, I think of her so often and I, I still am close to her friend, her kids on social media, but I'll tell you, um, she, I had done a few things in Vegas with her, but you know, she and I love to gamble. So I remember them, we'd be like, this is before they, you know, when you cash out of a machine and it gives you a ticket, this is like when the quarters come running out and she's in her gown and I'm in my tuxedo and they're going, ladies and gentlemen, the queen of teas. And we'd be going, she's going, get the quarters, get the quarters and come in. And <laughs> we'd be out at the slot machine in Atlantic city or Vegas and, you know, collecting all the money, you know, it's wow. crazy, crazy. Well, but Michael, the best I think we us, but we're at the end of our show. Oh my uh, God. Since we just started, and before you know it. Wait a minute. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, if you enjoyed the show, and I hope you all did, uh, please go to my website if you haven't done so already, richardskipper.com. Sign the guest book with your thoughts about the show. That helps to boost me in other markets. Um, I also... I end every show by telling you, uh, well, I want to let you all know that tomorrow I'm doing a very special show. I do this thing called the Full Moon Positive Book Club uh, because I'm all about positivity. And tomorrow afternoon, I am interviewing Amy Ostreicher. Um, she has the most amazing journey. Uh, she almost died. She spent three months in a coma, but her outlook on life uh, is just one of the most uplifting books. Here it is my beautiful detour uh, that I have ever, ever read. Just an amazing person. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list, go to the ninth name that pops up and reach out to that person with a phone call. Not an email, not a text, not a private message, but a phone call and let them know what they mean to you. As my dear friend, David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. You don't know what anyone else is going through at this given moment. So reach out, do that. And Michael, I again, you are, uh, you know, I, I've admired you um, now even more than before, if that's possible. Uh, thank okay. you for sitting down with me tonight. Um, I want to give you the final word. Anything that you want to expound upon that we talked about tonight, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone uh, who's listening right now. And again, thank you. And anytime you want to come and sit with me, you've got a platform right here. Very sweet, Richard. I really appreciate you having me on the show. And I thank um, Sue for getting connecting me and Celeste for connecting me with you. And um, so I'm happy that all worked out. And before I do uh, leave us with something, I just want to also say every Thursday I do my live Instagram live shows um, with a with a past person from Idol. So and I have Clay Aiken tomorrow and I just I have different one every week. And so I hope people can come join me on my Instagram on that. But let me just say, first of all, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I. I want to take every single day at a time. I, it's looking at the big picture is so overwhelming sometimes for all of us. And I just want everyone to stay safe and get vaccinated so we can all be together again and hug each other and be in the same room and make music together. And, and, um, and really, um, I, I really um, appreciate you be, having me on the show. And I just, we all, like, we all need to stay blessed and we all need to stay grateful for everything in our lives. Oh, that sounds so John Bacchino. <laughs> What time do you want to be there? What's that? What time tomorrow I want to be there for your show? Um, that was that would be fun. I'm I'm on Instagram Live every Friday, every Thursday night at four a uh, five o'clock my time, eight o'clock West Coast. But tomorrow, because of Clay Aiken's schedule, we've had to move it an hour earlier. So is that gonna interrupt with your show? It's where it's seven. Oh, no, no, no. And you can always catch me at another go to watch this. Catch I me will. another time. I will. Uh, but I wanna I, I mean 
well, uh, talk to him about his North Carolina uh, run because, you know, I was rooting for him. Yes, I know. Well, he's a man of many talents and, and uh, interests and stuff. So I'm looking forward to talking to him about it uh, tomorrow, all of it. Well, thank you. And thank, thank you, everybody. Ben. God bless everybody.